So at the end of the lecture introducing Diffie-Hellman key exchange, we got to this slide talking about practical problems. So one of the issues in Diffie-Hellman is that, well, there's two parties, Alice and Bob, who each pick some secret exponent and then they get a shared key, but they cannot figure out whether there's something in the middle, whether there's an Eve who is relaying all messages. And I was saying that, well, we can't detect this until uh, unless Alice and Bob have some form of long-term key that they both know, or if they have a way to compare the keys out of band. Now, if they can compare the keys out of band, say with a QR code or with a, a short hash string that they can read out, they can see that the fingerprint of the key G to the AE is different from the key G to the BF, and so they know that they are having some man in the middle or rather Eve in the middle. Now, this lecture is about how to do this in practice, um, at least if you don't have the QR code possibility, so if you don't have any out-of-band way of, of talking to it. For instance, your bank will not be willing to uh, give you a phone call just to verify that everything is fine. So how does your browser figure out it's the bank? How do you get key exchanges working on the internet? And what are the protocols to do this? Now, we will always assume that Alice and Bob know each other by their long-term keys. So whether it's signing keys or Diffie-Hellman keys, they do know each other. So let's start with what is called the Niethem-Schröder identification protocol. So Niethem and Schröder came up with two protocols. This is the public key version. There's also a symmetric key version, which is, for instance, used in Kerberos. So in this public key version, um, each of them has a public key. Well, Alice has HA, Bob has HB, and they know each other by these keys. And in the end, you don't care whether it's your bank, as long as the bank is the one which you know by this key, and that is what has your account information and is dealing with your money the right way. Now, here's what Alice is doing. Well, there's always some randomness involved, and so she's going to pick a random nonce, and Alice just some parameter of the protocol, so some fixed length string. And Alice will test whether Bob is really the Bob that she knows by seeing whether he can decrypt this nonce. So she will encrypt to him, him being his public key, uh, this nonce that is just chosen for this one execution of the protocol. Well, Bob also needs to know whom to reply to, so she includes her public key. So then she sends the encryption under Bob's public key of this random string and of her public key to him. Now Bob decrypts, he knows a secret key for the H sub B, obtains the nonce and adds his public key, and then does a matching site. So Bob also uh, picks a Albert string and will send this to Alice. Now, well, it's kind of important that these messages belong together. So he proves to Alice that yes, he was able to recover the answer A and here's a challenge for Alice, the answer B. So Alice receiving this, she checks, she verifies that Bob is actually the real Bob by being the one who can decrypt. So Bob has correctly identified N sub A, she obtains the N sub P at B and will then tell Bob, yep, I know I have the secret key for this N sub F, H sub A, and here is what you sent me. So at that point, Bob decrypts this, verifies it's the correct nonce, and then both of them are convinced that they're talking to each other. So they're using the hash of these two nonces as a key for symmetric crypto, because those are fresh for each protocol one. I will be using in this uh, lecture several of these diagrams, so let me shorten this a little bit. So the, um, the arrow with a dollar sign means to sample randomly, so I will just have that line and no longer write that it's sampling the Albert nonce. And also if there's an arrow saying encrypt, then I will leave out that Alice has to encrypt this. You can see from the arrows what the public key was, you can see from the arrows what the payload, so the message, was. And of course, once such a message arrives, then the other side will decrypt it and also obtain the contents and then, depending on what makes sense, either verify or obtain for the first time. So we will be use, writing this protocol in this slightly shorter form. This will be important on the next slide because we're trying to get even in the middle, of course. So first the questions, does this actually achieve the purpose? I was saying optimistically, well, at this point, Alice is convinced she's talking to Bob, Bob is convinced he's talking to Alice. But can Eve get in the middle? Can she somehow 
interfere with this? Can she still talk to Alice and to Bob, making them believe they're talking to each other? So is Alice actually sure she's talking to Bob? Is Bob sure he's talking to Alice? For our attacker, we should remember that Eve can interrupt network packages. So just because Alice decided to send something to Bob does not mean it actually reached Bob. It will go to Bob via Eve, if Eve chooses so. So that is not a reason why you could say, yes, uh, Eve can't be in the middle. But she has chosen to encrypt to Bob. So it might be a little bit tricky to get in that. So how can we do a Eve in the middle in this meet and shirt protocol? First of all, well, it's already a bad thing for the protocol if she can impersonate one part into the other. So let's do the side, well, it's also the only side that I should know how to do, of impersonating Alice to Bob. So Eve will get in the middle, but not for both sides. And she also needs sort of the cooperation of Alice, but as an innocent party. So let's assume that, Alice, uh, that Eve can convince Alice to start talking to her. Say, Eve calls up Alice saying, hey, I think my crypto box is wrong. I, I've been trying to talk to you, but it does, doesn't get a connection. Hey, can you just start a connection with me? And then, well, Alice is a nice person. That's story normally at least. And so Alice will start the communication. And here we have the normal first phase in the Needham Sugar Protocol. So, well, Alice talks to Eve and knows it's Eve, so she will be using Eve's public key. So Eve will get the payload there, so she will figure out what N sub A is. And, well, H sub A she knows anyway, but she can decrypt anything that Alice sends. So that's the important part. Now, what can Eve do to impersonate Alice to Bob. In order to tell Bob, hey, I'm Alice, well, she definitely has to send H sub A. And the nonce, there's nothing specific in it. So that's just the random number. And so the easiest that Eve can do is just send this on. So Eve will now, of course, encrypt it to Bob, but will send the same message encrypted to Bob. So now it's H sub B instead of H, H sub E, but there's no change in that. Okay, so at this point, Bob gets a message claiming to come from, from Alice. He decrypts it, obtains N sub A, H sub A says, ah, Alice wants to talk to me. How nice, hasn't happened in a while. Well, let's go ahead. Let's pick our random nonce. So he picks his N sub B, and then, well, thinking it comes from Alice, he encrypts this to Alice. So he answers with a valid N sub A and he includes his random nonce N sub B. Now this, well, Eve grabs the packet, but she can't actually do anything with it because it's not encrypted to her. So she just gets a question mark. But do you see how you can use Alice now and the fact that you have a valid connection open or an ongoing connection open with Alice to use Alice as a decryption or? So most importantly, look at what the second message is doing. There is no indication saying, hey, I come from Bob. There is no H sub B in there. It is only giving the nonce. Well, it has the N sub A to change it to the previous message and to prove that you could decrypt. And has a new N sub B, but it doesn't say, hey, I'm Bob's message. So what Eve can do is she can just relay this to Alice. It's just the valid encryption to Alice. And then Alice, still thinking she's in the Needham Schroeder identification protocol with Eve, well, she just thinks, well, Eve has chosen N sub B and now wants to get the verification here. And, well, since she has this protocol open with Eve, she will encrypt the answer to Eve. So now Alice has sent N sub B that Eve couldn't get before to Eve, encrypted to Eve's public key. So now Eve has N sub B, and she can complete the protocol to Bob. At this point, she can tell Alice, hey, thanks, uh, I'm glad it's still working, hangs up. And the interesting part is 
Well, Alice is convinced she's talking with Eve, and that is correct. But Bob, he has used Alice's public key, and then Alice has been able to decrypt. Alice, well, Eve, has been able to send him the answer B, where we were convinced that only Alice has the ability to decrypt it. <laughs> sure, it was Alice who decrypted it, but by thinking that she's talking to Eve and is just verifying the challenge thing. And so Bob is now convinced he's talking to Alice and will tell him things that he probably wouldn't be telling to Eve. So Eve has impersonated Alice successfully to Bob. So this is a big flaw in this protocol. You can think about how you can patch it, for instance, you could include that, hey, this is a message from Bob, and then Eve would not, uh, then Alice would not reply to Eve, but go like, hey, I don't have a connection open with Bob, where does it come from? But it's interesting that this protocol, which looked pretty okay to begin with, actually has this big flaw that Eve can get in the middle. One way out, obviously, is you can use signatures. So here's how you would do the diffie with signatures. Alice and Bob both just sample the normal uh, diffie Hellman secrets. So Alice picks an R, Bob pops, picks an S, so those are the short-term secrets. And then they also have a signing key and, well, so they sign with their secret keys, the G to the R and G to the S, respectively. And then Alice and Bob, well, they get the message, they verify them, they're convinced it comes from the right party, and then they compute the diffie Hellman pair. So nothing wrong here. Well, signatures are not to a specific person, so these can be replayed. But at least Alice, at some point, to somebody, actually wanted to use G to the R. A downside is that this actually requires signatures in addition to the diffie hellman protocol. So you need to have two primitives rather than just diffie hellman or an encryption system. So then um, a different way is what is called the triple diffie hellman and so that one is purely using diffie hellman keys. So Alice has her long-term keys and she knows Bob's public long-term key. So both of them has kind of what we call a long-term or identity key but in this case, it's a diffie Hellman key. And then, just like in the last protocol, they sample. But in this case, they don't need to verify any signatures. So Alice just sends G to the R, Bob sends G to the S. And now, of course, Alice, uh, Eve could be in the middle and send those messages. But then let's look at what the key actually is. So in the key, there are three components. So we have four, say, let's start with Alice. So we're using Alice's long-term secret key A on Bob's ephemeral diffie Hellman share G to the S. And Bob can compute the same by taking Alice's long-term public key to his short-term S. And then we have the matching one, which is using Bob's long-term B with Alice's short-term R. So both of them also compute the same one there. And we have a natural way of ordering it because Alice initiated the conversation Bob responds, so we know that we put Alice's public key first and then Bob's public key, with private key, public key replaced according to who's computing it. And then the last field, that is a normal diffie Hellman G to the RS. So who can compute this key? Obviously, Alice and Bob can compute this. So if you have the knowledge that Alice has of her long-term lowercase a and this one-term ephemeral r, or if you're Bob, you know your long-term B and your short-term S, then you're able to compute this key. And the idea behind triple triple for Hellman is that you, well, kind of need to know these, right? But here's the weird one. You can also recover K by knowing both R and S. Well, that's kind of odd because, I mean, knowing R and S, that's what Alice and Bob are putting in there. So those are the ephemeral pieces. Yeah, of course, if, you, if you're playing Eve by yourself, you're not communicating to anybody, then you can also get this key. But what's the interesting thing there? So this is actually considered a concern because of um, sometimes when number generators are broken or they're predictable or they're really, really bad. So let's assume that Eve knows S. So Eve knows what Bob is going to use for his reply. 
Then she can just do what Alice would be doing, pick some random R, she knows what Bob is going to do, so she knows Bob's S, and then she can compute the same K. So if there's now a phase afterwards where both of them prove possession of K, say Alice encrypts hi on Alice using this key, and Bob replies, yes, I know you, Alice and Bob, then Eve can actually do that. So signal the, um, oh sorry, you could deal with this by including G to the AB. So instead of a triple Diffie Hellman, you can do a quadruple Diffie Hellman. So you include both long term keys, and that deals with this issue. Um, it's a one time computation. Bob could even keep this uh, shared key next to Alice's public key as he, well, whenever I'm dealing with Alice, I'll hash in this G to the AB. So it's not an extra computation, it's just a bit of extra storage. Um, it feels like, or it felt like, um, there's nothing interesting in this GAB because it always is the same. But this concern about the broken random number generator is enough to concern people. And so, well, you can include G to the AB. And the signal protocol, which you might be using for secure messaging on your phone, uh, has actually used this triple Diffie Hellman and then changed to what they call extended uh, triple Diffie Hellman. Um, this is mostly an issue because they have a bunch of Alice one-time keys um, available on their server for the case that Bob wants to talk to Alice and Alice is currently offline. So he can actually ask the key server, hey, give me one of uh, Alice's ephemeral keys and then starts encrypting to this ephemeral key and Alice might not be online at that point. And so they included a signature on Alice's key. So using some long-term Alice signature key for these ephemeral G to the R, say that's a G to the R1, G to the R2, and so on, so that Bob can send a message to Alice without having to wait for her to confirm it. So they actually then did include signatures, so they are using both uh, Diffie Hellman and signatures, but they're also still using a flow which is similar to this flow where they're having the long-term keys and short-term keys, um, so identity keys and short-term ephemeral keys, mixed in order to um, link the identities and also get, well, you always want to have some randomness so that if somebody uh, picks up your server later on or picks up your phone later on, that they can't decrypt the message because you would have forgotten about the family keys. So that's called forward secrecy. So the triple Diffie Hellman or extended triple Diffie Hellman are now the state of the art or quadruple Diffie Hellman if you're concerned about broken random number generators. And that's what you should be using in order to secure your connections. You can also do something which some protocols are doing to actually keep a long-term secret that you keep on hashing in. So instead of keeping the G to the AB, you can also keep your last K. So you're updating the G to the AB, you just hash in the last K. So you have what is called key continuity. And that is even a little bit of a defense should quantum computers be coming.